Chapter Twenty Three of the New Magdalen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The New Magdalen by Wilkie Collins. Chapter Twenty Three. Lady Janet at Bay. The narrative leaves Julian and Mercy for a while, and ascending to the upstairs regions of the house, follows the march of events in Lady Janet's room. The maid had delivered her mistress's note to Mercy, and had gone away again on her second errand to Grace Rosebery in her boudoir. Lady Janet was seated at her writing-table, waiting for the appearance of the woman whom she had summoned to her presence. A single lamp diffused its mild light over the books, pictures, and busts round her, leaving the further end of the room in which the bed was placed almost lost in obscurity. The works of art were all portraits. The books were all presentation copies from the authors. It was Lady Janet's fancy to associate her bedroom with memorials of the various persons whom she had known in the long course of her life, most of them by this time gathered with the dead. She sat near her writing-table, lying back in her easy-chair, the living realization of the picture which Julian's description had drawn. Her eyes were fixed on the photographic likeness of Mercy, which was so raised upon a little gilt easel as to enable her to contemplate it under the full light of the lamp. The bright, mobile old face was strangely and sadly changed. The brow was fixed. The mouth was rigid. The whole face would have been like a mask, moulded in the hardest forms of passive resistance and suppressed rage, but for the light and life still thrown over it by the eyes. There was something unutterably touching in the keen, hungering tenderness of the look which they fixed on the portrait, intensified by an underlying expression of fond and patient reproach. The danger which Julian so wisely dreaded was in the rest of the face. The love which he had so truly described was in the eyes alone. They still spoke of the cruelly profaned affection which had been the one immeasurable joy, the one inexhaustible hope, of Lady Janet's closing life. The brow expressed nothing but her obstinate determination to stand by the wreck of that joy, to rekindle the dead ashes of that hope. The lips were only eloquent of her unflinching resolution to ignore the hateful present, and to save the sacred past. My idol may be shattered, but none of you shall know it. I stopped the march of discovery, I extinguished the light of truth, I am deaf to your words, and blind to your proofs. At seventy years old, my idol is my life, it shall be my idol still. The silence in the bedroom was broken by a murmuring of women's voices outside the door. Lady Janet instantly raised herself in the chair and snatched the photograph off the easel. She laid the portrait face downward among some papers on the table, then abruptly changed her mind and hid it among the thick folds of lace which clothed her neck and bosom. There was a world of love in the action itself, and in the sudden softening of the eyes which accompanied it. The next moment Lady Janet's mask was on. Any superficial observer who had seen her now would have said, "'This is a hard woman.' The door was opened by the maid. Grace Rosebery entered the room. She advanced rapidly with a defiant assurance in her manner, and a lofty carriage of her head. She sat down in the chair to which Lady Janet silently pointed, with a thump. She returned Lady Janet's grave bow with a nod and a smile. Every movement and every look of the little, worn, white-faced, shabbily dressed woman expressed insolent triumph, and said, as if in words, "'My turn has come.' "'I am glad to wait on your ladyship,' she began, without giving Lady Janet an opportunity of speaking first. "'Indeed, I should have felt it my duty to request an interview, if you had not sent your maid to invite me up here.' "'You would have felt it your duty to request an interview?' Lady Janet repeated very quietly. "'Why?' The tone in which that one last word was spoken embarrassed Grace at the outset. It established as great a distance between Lady Janet and herself as if she had been lifted in her chair and conveyed bodily to the other end of the room. "'I am surprised that your ladyship should not understand me,' she said, struggling to conceal her confusion, "'especially after your kind offer of your own boudoir.' Lady Janet remained perfectly unmoved. "'I do not understand you,' she answered, just as quietly as ever. Grace's temper came to her assistance. She recovered the assurance which had marked her first appearance on the scene. "'In that case,' she resumed, "'I must enter into particulars, in justice to myself. I can place but one interpretation on the extraordinary change in your ladyship's behaviour to me downstairs. 
the conduct of that abominable woman has at last opened your eyes to the deception that has been practised on you for some reason of your own however you have not yet chosen to recognise me openly in this painful position something is due to my own self-respect i cannot and will not permit mercy merrick to claim the merit of restoring me to my proper place in this house after what i have suffered it is quite impossible for me to endure that i should have requested an interview if you had not sent for me for the express purpose of claiming this person's immediate expulsion from the house i claim it now as a proper concession to me whatever you or mr julian gray may do i will not tamely permit her to exhibit herself as an interesting penitent it is really a little too much to hear this brazen adventuress appoint her own time for explaining herself it is too deliberately insulting to see her sail out of the room with a clergyman of the church of england opening the door for her as if she were laying me under an obligation i can forgive much lady janet including the terms in which you have thought it decent to order me out of your house i am quite willing to accept the offer of your boudoir as the expression on your part of a better frame of mind but even christian charity has its limits the continued presence of that wretch under your roof is you will permit me to remark not only a monument of your own weakness but a perfectly insufferable insult to me there she stopped abruptly not for want of words but for want of a listener lady janet was not even pretending to attend to her lady janet with a deliberate rudeness entirely foreign to her usual habits was composedly busying herself in arranging the various papers scattered about the table some she tied together with little morsels of string some she placed under paperweights some she deposited in the fantastic pigeonholes of a little japanese cabinet working with a placid enjoyment of her own orderly occupation and perfectly unaware to all outward appearance that any second person was in the room she looked up with her papers in both hands when grace stopped and said quietly have you done is your ladyship's purpose in sending for me to treat me with studied rudeness grace retorted angrily my purpose in sending for you is to say something as soon as you will allow me the opportunity the impenetrable composure of that reply took grace completely by surprise she had no retort ready in sheer astonishment she waited silently with her eyes riveted on the mistress of the house lady janet put down her papers and settled herself comfortably in the easy chair preparatory to opening the interview on her side the little that i have to say to you she began may be said in a question am i right in supposing that you have no present employment and that a little advance in money delicately offered would be very acceptable to you do you mean to insult me lady janet certainly not i mean to ask you a question your question is an insult my question is a kindness if you will only understand it as it is intended i don't complain of your not understanding it i don't even hold you responsible for any one of the many breaches of good manners which you have committed since you have been in this room i was honestly anxious to be of some service to you and you have repelled my advances i am sorry let us drop the subject expressing herself in the most perfect temper in those terms lady janet resumed the arrangement of her papers and became unconscious once more of the presence of any second person in the room grace opened her lips to reply with the utmost intemperance of an angry woman and thinking better of it controlled herself it was plainly useless to take the violent way with lady janet roy her age and her social position were enough of themselves to repel any violence she evidently knew that and trusted to it grace resolved to meet the enemy on the neutral ground of politeness as the most promising ground that she could occupy under present circumstances if i have said anything hasty i beg to apologize to your ladyship she began may i ask if your only object in sending for me was to inquire into my pecuniary affairs with a view to assisting me that said lady janet was my only object you had nothing to say to me on the subject of mercy merrick nothing whatever i am weary of hearing of mercy merrick have you any more questions to ask me i have one more yes i wish to ask your ladyship whether you propose to recognize me in the presence of your household as the late colonel rosebery's daughter i have already recognized you as a lady in embarrassed circumstances who has peculiar claims on my consideration and forbearance if you wish me to repeat those words in the presence of the servants absurd as it is i am ready to comply with your request 
Grace's temper began to get the better of her prudent resolutions. "'Lady Janet,' she said, "'this won't do. I must request you to express yourself plainly. You talk of my peculiar claims on your forbearance. What claims do you mean?' "'It will be painful to both of us if we enter into details,' replied Lady Janet. "'Pray don't let us enter into details.' "'I insist on it, madam.' "'Pray don't insist on it.' Grace was deaf to remonstrance. "'I ask you in plain words,' she went on. "'Do you acknowledge that you have been deceived by an adventuress who has impersonated me? "'Do you mean to restore me to my proper place in this house?' Lady Janet returned to the arrangements of her papers. "'Does your ladyship refuse to listen to me?' Lady Janet looked up from her papers as blandly as ever. "'If you persist in returning to your delusion,' she said, "'you will oblige me to persist in returning to my papers. "'What is my delusion, if you please?' "'Your delusion is expressed in the questions you have just put to me. "'Your delusion constitutes your peculiar claim on my forbearance. "'Nothing you can say or do will shake my forbearance. "'When I first found you in the dining-room, I acted most improperly. "'I lost my temper. I did worse.' I was foolish enough and imprudent enough to send for a police officer. I owe you every possible atonement, afflicted as you are, for treating you in that cruel manner. I offered you the use of my boudoir as part of my atonement. I sent for you, in the hope that you would allow me to assist you as part of my atonement. You may behave rudely to me, you may speak in the most abusive terms of my adopted daughter. I will submit to anything as part of my atonement." So long as you abstain from speaking on one painful subject, I will listen to you with the greatest pleasure. Whenever you return to that subject, I will return to my papers. Grace looked at Lady Janet with an evil smile. I begin to understand your ladyship, she said. You are ashamed to acknowledge that you have been grossly imposed upon. Your only alternative, of course, is to ignore everything that has happened. Pray count on my forbearance. I am not at all offended. I am merely amused. It is not every day that a lady of high rank exhibits herself in such a position as yours to an obscure woman like me. Your humane consideration for me dates, I presume, from the time when your adopted daughter set you the example by ordering the police officer out of the room. Lady Janet's composure was proof even against this assault on it. She gravely accepted Grace's inquiry as a question addressed to her in perfect good faith. I am not at all surprised she replied, to find that my adopted daughter's interference has exposed her to misrepresentation. She ought to have remonstrated with me privately before she interfered. But she has one fault. She is too impulsive. I have never, in all my experience, met with such a warm-hearted person as she is, always too considerate of others, always too forgetful of herself. The mere appearance of the police officer placed you in a situation to appeal to her compassion, and her impulses carried her away as usual. My fault, all my fault. Grace changed her tone once more. She was quick enough to discern that Lady Janet was a match for her with her own weapons. We have had enough of this, she said. It is time to be serious. Your adopted daughter, as you call her, is Mercy Merrick, and you know it. Lady Janet returned to her papers. I am Grace Rosebury, whose name she has stolen, and you know that. Lady Janet went on with her papers. Grace got up from her chair. "'I accept your silence, Lady Janet,' she said, "'as an acknowledgment of your deliberate resolution to suppress the truth. You are evidently determined to receive the adventuress as the true woman, and you don't scruple to face the consequences of that proceeding by pretending to my face to believe that I am mad. I will not allow myself to be impudently cheated out of my rights in this way. You will hear from me again, madam, when the Canadian mail arrives in England.' She walked toward the door. This time Lady Janet answered, as readily and as explicitly as it was possible to desire. "'I shall refuse to receive your letters,' she said. Grace returned a few steps, threateningly. "'My letters shall be followed by my witnesses,' she proceeded. "'I shall refuse to receive your witnesses.' "'Refuse at your peril. I will appeal to the law.' Lady Janet smiled. "'I don't pretend to know much of the subject,' she said but I should be surprised indeed if I discovered that you had any claim on me which the law could enforce. However, let us suppose that you can set the law in action. You know as well as I do that the only motive power which can do that is money. I am rich. Fees, costs, and all the rest of it are matters of no consequence to me. May I ask if you are in the same position? The question silenced Grace. 
So far as money was concerned, she was literally at the end of her resources. Her only friends were friends in Canada. After what she had said to him in the boudoir, it would be quite useless to appeal to the sympathies of Julian Gray. In the pecuniary sense, and in one word, she was absolutely incapable of gratifying her own vindictive longings. And there sat the mistress of Mablethorpe House, perfectly well aware of it. Lady Janet pointed to the empty chair. "'Suppose you sit down again?' she suggested. "'The course of our interview seems to have brought us back to the question that I asked you when you came into my room. Instead of threatening me with the law, suppose you consider the propriety of permitting me to be of some use to you. I am in the habit of assisting ladies in embarrassed circumstances, and nobody knows of it but my steward, who keeps the accounts, and myself.' Once more, let me inquire if a little advance of the pecuniary sort, delicately offered, would be acceptable to you. Grace returned slowly to the chair that she had left. She stood by it, with one hand grasping the top rail, and with her eyes fixed in mocking scrutiny on Lady Janet's face. At last your ladyship shows your hand, she said. Hush, money! You will send me back to my papers, rejoined Lady Janet. How obstinate you are! Grace's hand closed tighter and tighter around the rail of the chair. Without witnesses, without means, without so much as a refuge, thanks to her own coarse cruelties of language and conduct, in the sympathies of others, the sense of her isolation and her helplessness was almost maddening at that final moment. A woman of finer sensibilities would have instantly left the room. Grace's impenetrably hard and narrow mind impelled her to meet the emergency in a very different way. A last base vengeance, to which Lady Janet had voluntarily exposed herself, was still within her reach. For the present, she thought, there is but one way of being even with your ladyship. I can cost you as much as possible. Pray make some allowances for me, she said. I am not obstinate. I am only a little awkward at matching the audacity of a lady of high rank. I shall improve with practice. I own my language is, as I am painfully aware, only plain English. Permit me to withdraw it and to substitute yours. What advance is your ladyship delicately prepared to offer me? Lady Janet opened a drawer and took out her cheque-book. The moment of relief had come at last. The only question now left to discuss was evidently the question of amount. Lady Janet considered a little. The question of amount was, to her mind, in some sort a question of conscience as well. Her love for mercy and her loathing for grace her horror of seeing her darling degraded and her affection profaned by a public exposure had hurried her there was no disputing it into treating an injured woman harshly hateful as grace rosebery might be her father had left her in his last moments with lady janet's full concurrence to lady janet's care but for mercy she would have been received at mablethorpe house as lady janet's companion with a salary of one hundred pounds a year on the other hand, how long, and with such a temper as she had revealed, would Grace have remained in the surface of her protectress? She would probably have been dismissed in a few weeks, with a year's salary to compensate her, and with a recommendation to some suitable employment. What would be a fair compensation now? Lady Janet decided that five years' salary immediately given, and future assistance rendered if necessary, would represent a fit remembrance of the late Colonel Rosebery's claims, and a liberal pecuniary acknowledgment of any harshness of treatment which Grace might have sustained at her hands. At the same time, and for the further satisfying of her own conscience, she determined to discover the sum which Grace herself would consider sufficient, by the simple process of making Grace herself propose the terms. "'It is impossible for me to make you an offer,' she said, "'for this reason. Your need of money will depend greatly on your future plans. I am quite ignorant of your future plans.' "'Perhaps your ladyship will kindly advise me,' said Grace satirically. "'I cannot altogether undertake to advise you,' Lady Janet replied. "'I can only suppose that you will scarcely remain in England where you have no friends. "'Whether you go to the law with me or not, "'you will surely feel the necessity of communicating personally with your friends in Canada. "'Am I right?' "'Grace was quite quick enough to understand this as it was meant. "'Properly interpreted, the answer signified,' If you take your compensation in money, it is understood as part of the bargain that you don't remain in England to annoy me. Your ladyship is quite right, she said. I shall certainly not remain in England. 
I shall consult my friends, and, she added mentally, go to the law with you afterwards, if I possibly can, with your own money. You will return to Canada, Lady Janet proceeded, and your prospects there will be, probably, a little uncertain at first. Taking this into consideration, at what amount do you estimate, in your own mind, the pecuniary assistance which you will require? May I count on your ladyship's kindness to correct me, if my own ignorant calculations turn out to be wrong? Grace asked innocently. Here again the words, properly interpreted, had a special signification of their own. It is stipulated on my part that I put myself up to auction, and that my estimate shall be regulated by your ladyship's highest bid. Thoroughly understanding the stipulation, Lady Janet bowed and waited gravely. Gravely, on her side, Grace began. "'I'm afraid I should want more than a hundred pounds,' she said. Lady Janet made her first bid. "'I think so, too. More perhaps than two hundred. Lady Janet made her second bid. "'Probably.' "'More than three hundred? Four hundred? Five hundred? Lady Janet made her highest bid. Five hundred pounds will do,' she said. In spite of herself, Grace's rising colour betrayed her ungovernable excitement. From her earliest childhood she had been accustomed to see shillings and sixpences carefully considered before they were parted with. She had never known her father to possess so much as five golden sovereigns at his own disposal, unencumbered by debt, in all her experience of him. The atmosphere in which she had lived and breathed was the all-stifling one of genteel poverty. There was something horrible in the greedy eagerness of her eyes as they watched Lady Janet, to see if she was really sufficiently in earnest to give away five hundred pounds sterling with a stroke of her pen. Lady Janet wrote the cheque in a few seconds, and pushed it across the table. Grace's hungry eyes devoured the golden line. "'Pay to myself or bearer five hundred pounds.' and verified the signature beneath, Janet Roy. Once sure of the money, whenever she chose to take it, the native meanness of her nature instantly asserted itself. She tossed her head and let the cheque lie on the table, with an overacted appearance of caring very little whether she took it or not. "'Your ladyship is not to suppose that I snap at your cheque,' she said. Lady Janet leaned back in her chair and closed her eyes. The very sight of Grace Rosebury sickened her. Her mind filled suddenly of the image of mercy." She longed to feast her eyes again on that grand beauty, to fill her ears again with the melody of that gentle voice. "'I require time to consider. In justice to my own self-respect,' Grace went on. Lady Janet wearily made a sign, granting time to consider. "'Your ladyship's boudoir is, I presume, still at my disposal?' Lady Janet silently granted the boudoir. "'And your ladyship's servants are at my orders, if I have occasion to employ them?' Lady Janet suddenly opened her eyes. "'The whole household is at your orders,' she cried furiously. "'Leave me!' Grace was far from being offended. If anything, she was gratified. There was a certain triumph in having stung Lady Janet into an open outbreak of temper. She insisted forthwith on another condition. "'In the event of my deciding to receive the cheque,' she said, "'I cannot, consistently with my own self-respect, permit it to be delivered to me otherwise than enclosed.' "'Your ladyship will, if necessary, be so kind as to enclose it. "'Good evening.' "'She sauntered to the door, looking from side to side "'with an air of supreme disparagement "'at the priceless treasures of art which adorned the walls. "'Her eyes dropped superciliously on the carpet, "'the design of a famous French painter, "'as if her feet condescended in walking over it. "'The audacity with which she had entered the room had been marked enough, it shrank to nothing before the infinitely superior proportions of the insolence with which she left it. The instant the door was closed, Lady Janet rose from her chair. Reckless of the wintry chill in the outer air, she threw open one of the windows. Pah! she exclaimed with a shudder of disgust. The very air of the room is tainted by her. She returned to her chair. Her mood changed as she sat down again. Her heart was with mercy once more. Oh, my love, she murmured. How low I have stooped, how miserably I have degraded myself, and all for you. The bitterness of the retrospect was unendurable. The inbred force of the woman's nature took refuge from it in an outburst of defiance and despair. Whatever she has done, that wretch deserves it. Not a living creature in this house shall say she has deceived me. She has not deceived me. She loves me. What do I care whether she has given me her true name or not? She has given me her true heart. 
what right had julian to play upon her feelings and pry into her secrets my poor tempted tortured child i won't hear her confession not another word shall she say to any living creature i am mistress i will forbid it at once she snatched a sheet of note-paper from the case hesitated and threw it from her on the table why not send for my darling she thought why write she hesitated once more and resigned the idea no i can't trust myself i daren't see her yet she took up the sheet of paper again and wrote her second message to mercy this time the note began fondly with a familiar form of address my dear child i have had time to think and compose myself a little since i last wrote requesting you to defer the explanation which you had promised me i already understand and appreciate the motives which led you to interfere as you did downstairs and i now ask you to entirely abandon this explanation it will i am sure be painful to you for reasons of your own into which i have no wish to inquire to produce the person of whom you spoke and as you know already i myself am weary of hearing of her besides there is really no need now for you to explain anything the stranger whose visits here have caused us so much pain and anxiety will trouble us no more she leaves england of her own free will after a conversation with me which has perfectly succeeded in composing and satisfying her not a word more my dear to me or to my nephew or to any other human creature of what has happened in the dining-room to-day when we next meet let it be understood between us that the past is henceforth and forever buried to oblivion this is not only the earnest request it is if necessary the positive command of your mother and friend janet roy p s i shall find opportunities before you leave your room of speaking separately to my nephew and to horace holmcroft you need dread no embarrassment when you next meet them i will not ask you to answer my note in writing say yes to the maid who will bring it to you and i shall know we understand each other after sealing the envelope which enclosed these lines lady janet addressed it as usual to miss grace rosebury she was just rising to ring the bell when the maid appeared with a message from the boudoir the woman's tones and looks showed plainly that she had been made the object of grace's insolent self-assertion as well as her mistress if you please my lady the person downstairs wishes lady janet frowning contemptuously interrupted the message at the outset i know what the person downstairs wishes she has sent you for a letter from me yes my lady anything more she has sent one of the men-servants my lady for a cab if your ladyship had only heard how she spoke to him lady janet intimated by a sign that she would rather not hear she at once enclosed the check in an undirected envelope take that to her she said and then come back to me dismissing grace rosebury from all further consideration lady janet sat with her letter to mercy in her hand reflecting on her position and on the efforts which it might still demand from her pursuing this train of thought it now occurred to her that accident might bring horace and mercy together at any moment and that in horace's present frame of mind he would certainly insist on the very explanation which it was the foremost interest of her life to suppress the dread of this disaster was in full possession of her when the maid returned where is mr holmcroft she asked the moment the woman entered the room i saw him open the library door my lady just now on my way upstairs was he alone yes my lady go to him and say i want to see him here immediately the maid withdrew on her second errand lady janet rose restlessly and closed the open window her impatient desire to make sure of horace so completely mastered her that she left her room and met the woman in the corridor on her return receiving horace's message of excuse she instantly sent back the peremptory rejoinder say that he will oblige me to go to him if he persists in refusing to come to me and stay she added remembering the undelivered letter send miss rosebury's maid here i want her left alone again lady janet paced once or twice up and down the corridor then grew suddenly weary of the sight of it and went back to her room the two maids returned together one of them having announced horace's submission was dismissed the other was sent to mercy's room with lady janet's letter in a minute or two the messenger appeared again with the news that she had found the room empty have you any idea where miss rosebury is no my lady lady janet reflected for a moment 
if horace presented himself without any needless delay the plain inference would be that she had succeeded in separating him from mercy if his appearance was suspiciously deferred she decided on personally searching for mercy in the reception rooms on the lower floor of the house what have you done with the letter she asked i left it on miss rosebury's table my lady very well keep within hearing of the bell in case i want you again another minute brought lady janet's suspense to an end she heard the welcome sound of a knock at her door from a man's hand horace hurriedly entered the room what is it you want with me lady janet he inquired not very graciously sit down horace and you shall hear horace did not accept the invitation excuse me he said if i mention that i am rather in a hurry why are you in a hurry i have reasons for wishing to see grace as soon as possible and i have reasons lady janet rejoined for wishing to speak to you about grace before you see her serious reasons sit down horace started serious reasons he repeated you surprise me i shall surprise you still more before i have done their eyes met as lady janet answered in those terms horace observed signs of agitation in her which he now noticed for the first time his face darkened with an expression of sullen distrust and he took the chair in silence end of chapter twenty three Chapter Twenty Four of the New Magdalen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The New Magdalen by Wilkie Collins. Chapter Twenty Four Lady Janet's Letter. The narrative leaves Lady Janet and Horace Holmcroft together, and returns to Julian and Mercy in the library. An interval passed, a long interval, measured by the impatient reckoning of suspense, after the cab which had taken Grace Roseberry away had left the house. The minutes followed each other, and still the warning sound of Horace's footsteps was not heard on the marble pavement of the hall by common though unexpressed consent julian and mercy avoided touching upon the one subject on which they were now both interested alike with their thoughts fixed secretly in vain speculation on the nature of the interview which was then taking place in lady janet's room they tried to speak on topics indifferent to both of them tried and failed and tried again in a last and longest pause of silence between them the next event happened the door from the hall was softly and suddenly opened was it horace no not even yet the person who had opened the door was only mercy's maid my lady's love miss and will you please to read this directly giving her message in those terms the woman produced from the pocket of her apron lady janet's second letter to mercy with a strip of paper oddly pinned round the envelope Mercy detached the paper and found on the inner side some lines in pencil, hurriedly written in Lady Janet's hand. They ran thus. Don't lose a moment in reading my letter. And mind this, when age returns to you, meet him firmly, say nothing. Enlightened by the warning words which Julian had spoken to her, Mercy was at no loss to place the right interpretation on those strange lines. Instead of immediately opening the letter, she stopped the maid at the library door. Julian's suspicion of the most trifling events that were taking place in the house had found its way from his mind to hers. Wait, she said. I don't understand what is going on upstairs. I want to ask you something. The woman came back, not very willingly. How did you know I was here? Mercy inquired if you please miss her ladyship ordered me to take the letter to you some little time since you were not in your room and i left it on your table i understand that but how came you to bring the letter here my lady rang for me miss before i could knock at her door she came out into the corridor with that morsel of paper in her hand so as to keep you from entering her room yes miss her ladyship wrote on the paper in a great hurry and told me to pin it round the letter that I had left in your room. I was to take them both together to you and to let nobody see me, 
you will find Miss Rosebery in the library, her ladyship says. And run, 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 there isn't a moment to lose. Those were her own words, miss. Did you hear anything in the room before Lady Janet came out and met you? The woman hesitated and looked at Julian. I hardly know whether I ought to tell you, miss. Julian turned away to leave the library. Mercy stopped him by a motion of her hand. You know that I shall not get you into any trouble, she said to the maid, and you may speak quite safely before Mr. Julian Gray. Thus reassured, the maid spoke. To own the truth, miss, I heard Mr. Holmcroft in my lady's room. His voice sounded as if he was angry. I may say they were both angry, Mr. Holmcroft and my lady. She turned to Julian. And just before her ladyship came out, sir, I heard your name, as if it was you they were having words about. I can't say exactly what it was. I hadn't time to hear. And I didn't listen, miss. The door was ajar, and the voices were so loud nobody could help hearing them. It was useless to detain the woman any longer. Having given her leave to withdraw, Mercy turned to Julian. Why were they quarreling about you? she asked. Julian pointed to the unopened letter in her hand. The answer to your question may be there, he said. Read the letter while you have the chance, and if I can advise you, say so at once. With a strange reluctance, she opened the envelope. With a sinking heart, she read the lines in which Lady Janet, as mother and friend, commanded her absolutely to suppress the confession which she had pledged herself to make in the sacred interests of justice and truth. A low cry of despair escaped her as the cruel complication in her position revealed itself in all its unmerited hardship. Oh, Lady Janet, Lady Janet, she thought. There was but one trial more left in my hard lot, and it comes to me from you. She handed the letter to Julian. He took it from her in silence. His pale complexion turned paler still as he read it. His eyes rested on her compassionately as he handed it back. To my mind, he said, Lady Janet herself sets all further doubt at rest. Her letter tells me what she wanted when she sent for Horace, and why my name was mentioned between them. Tell me, cried Mercy eagerly. He did not immediately answer her. He sat down again in the chair by her side, and pointed to the letter. Has Lady Janet shaken your resolution? he asked. She has strengthened my resolution, Mercy answered. She has added a new bitterness to my remorse. She did not mean it harshly, but the reply sounded harshly in Julian's ears. It stirred the generous impulses which were the strongest impulses in his nature. He who had once pleaded with Mercy for compassionate consideration for herself, now pleaded with her for compassionate consideration for Lady Janet. With persuasive gentleness he drew a little nearer, and laid his hand on her arm. "'Don't judge her harshly,' he said. She's wrong, miserably wrong. She has recklessly degraded herself. She has recklessly tempted you. Still, is it generous? Is it even just to hold her responsible for deliberate sin? She's at the close of her days. She can feel no new affection. She can never replace you. View her position in that light, and you will see, as I see, that it is no base motive which has led her astray. Think of her wounded heart and her wasted life, and say to yourself forgivingly, She loves me. Mercy's eyes filled with tears. I do say it, she answered. Not forgivingly. It is I who have need of forgiveness. I say it gratefully when I think of her. I say it with shame and sorrow when I think of myself. He took her hand for the first time. He looked, guiltlessly looked, at her downcast face. He spoke as he had spoken at the memorable interview between them, which had made a new woman of her. I can imagine no cruel trial, he said, than the trial that is now before you. The benefactress to whom you owe everything asks nothing from you but your silence. 
the person whom you have wronged is no longer present to stimulate your resolution to speak horace himself unless i am entirely mistaken will not hold you to the explanation that you have promised the temptation to keep your false position in this house is i do not scruple to say all but irresistible sister and friend can you still justify my faith in you will you still own the truth without the base fear of discovery to drive you to it she lifted her head with the steady light of resolution shining again in her grand gray eyes her low sweet voice answered him without a faltering note in it i will you will do justice to the woman whom you have wronged unworthy as she is powerless as she is to expose you i will you will sacrifice everything you have gained by the fraud to the sacred duty of atonement you will suffer anything even though you offend the second mother who has loved you and sinned for you rather than suffer the degradation of yourself her hand closed firmly on his again and for the last time she answered i will his voice had not trembled yet it failed him now his next words were spoken in faint whispering tones to himself not to her thank god for this day he said i have been of some service to one of the noblest of god's creatures some subtle influence as he spoke passed from his hand to hers it trembled through her nerves it entwined itself mysteriously with the finest sensibilities in her nature it softly opened her heart to a first vague surmising of the devotion that she had inspired in him a faint glow of colour lovely in its faintness stole over her face and neck her breathing quickened tremblingly she drew her hand away from him and sighed when she had released it he rose suddenly to his feet and left her without a word or a look walking slowly down the length of the room when he turned and came back to her his face was composed he was master of himself again mercy was the first to speak she turned the conversation from herself by reverting to the proceedings in lady janet's room you spoke of horace just now she said in terms which surprised me you appeared to think that he would not hold me to my explanation is that one of the conclusions which you draw from lady janet's letter most assuredly julian answered you will see the conclusion as i see it if we return for a moment to grace rosebury's departure from the house mercy interrupted him there can you guess she asked how lady janet prevailed upon her to go i hardly like to own it said julian there is an expression in the letter which suggests to me that lady janet has offered her money and that she has taken the bribe oh i can't think that let us return to horace miss rosebury wants out of the house but one serious obstacle is left in lady janet's way that obstacle is horace holmcroft how is horace an obstacle he is an obstacle in this sense he is under an engagement to marry you in a week's time and lady janet is determined to keep him as she is determined to keep every one else in ignorance of the truth she will do that without scruple but the inbred sense of honour in her is not utterly silenced yet she cannot she dare not let horace make you his wife under the false impression that you are colonel rosebury's daughter you see the situation on the one hand she won't enlighten him on the other hand she cannot allow him to marry you blindfold in this emergency what is she to do there is but one alternative that i can discover she must persuade horace or she must irritate horace into acting for himself and breaking off the engagement on his own responsibility mercy stopped him impossible she cried warmly impossible look again at her letter julian rejoined it tells you plainly that you need fear no embarrassment when you next meet horace if words mean anything those words mean that he will not claim from you the confidence which you have promised to repose in him 
On what condition is it possible for him to abstain from doing that? On the one condition that you have ceased to represent the first and foremost interest of his life. Mercy still held firm. You are wronging Lady Janet, she said. Julian smiled sadly. Try to look at it, he answered, from Lady Janet's point of view. Do you suppose she sees anything derogatory to her and attempting to break off the marriage? I will answer for it. She believes she is doing you a kindness. In one sense it would be a kindness to spare you the shame of a humiliating confession and to save you possibly from being rejected to your face by the man you love. In my opinion the thing is done already. I have reasons of my own for believing that my aunt will succeed far more easily than she could anticipate. Horace's temper will help her. Mercy's mind began to yield to him, in spite of herself. What do you mean by Horace's temper? she inquired. Must you ask me that? he said, drawing back a little from her. I must. I mean by Horace's temper. Horace's unworthy distrust of the interest that I feel in you. She instantly understood him. And more than that, she secretly admired him for the scrupulous delicacy with which he had expressed himself. Another man would not have thought of sparing her in that way. Another man would have said plainly, Horace is jealous of me. Julian did not wait for her to answer him. He considerately went on. For the reason that I have just mentioned, he said, Horace will be easily irritated into taking a course which, in his calmer moments, nothing would induce him to adopt. Until I heard what your maid said to you, I had thought, for your sake, of retiring before he joined you here. Now I know that my name has been introduced and has made mischief upstairs, I feel the necessity, for your sake again, of meeting Horace and his temper face to face before you see him. Let me, if I can... Prepare him to hear you without any angry feeling in his mind toward you. Do you object to retire to the next room for a few minutes, in the event of his coming back to the library? Mercy's courage instantly rose with the emergency. She refused to leave the two men together. Don't think me insensible to your kindness, she said. If I leave you with Horace, I may expose you to insult. I refuse to do that. What makes you doubt his coming back? His prolonged absence makes me doubt it, Julian replied. In my belief, the marriage is broken off. He may go as Grace Rosebury has gone. You may never see him again. The instant the opinion was uttered, it was practically contradicted by the man himself. Horace opened the library door. End of chapter 24Chapter 25 of The New Magdalen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The New Magdalen by Wilkie Collins. Chapter 25 The Confession. He stopped just inside the door. His first look was for Mercy. His second look was for Julian. "'I knew it,' he said, with an assumption of sardonic composure. "'If I could only have persuaded Lady Janet to bet, I should have won a hundred pounds.' He advanced to Julian with a sudden change from irony to anger. "'Would you like to hear what the bet was?' he asked. I should prefer seeing you able to control yourself in the presence of this lady, Julian answered quietly. I offered to lay Lady Janet two hundred pounds to one, Horace proceeded, that I should find you here making love to Miss Rosebery behind my back. Mercy interfered before Julian could reply. "'If you cannot speak without insulting one of us,' she said, "'permit me to request that you will not address yourself to Mr. Julian Gray.' 
Horace bowed to her with a mockery of respect. "'Pray, don't alarm yourself. I am pledged to be scrupulously civil to both of you,' he said. "'Lady Janet only allowed me to leave her on condition of my promising to behave with perfect politeness. What else can I do? I have two privileged people to deal with, a parson and a woman. The parson's profession protects him, and the woman's sex protects her. You have got me at a disadvantage, and you both of you know it. I beg to apologise if I have forgotten the clergyman's profession and the lady's sex. "'You have forgotten more than that,' said Julian. "'You have forgotten that you were born a gentleman and bred a man of honour. "'So far as I am concerned, I don't ask you to remember that I am a clergyman. "'I obtrude my profession on nobody.' I only ask you to remember your birth and your breeding. It is quite bad enough to cruelly and unjustly suspect an old friend, who has never forgotten what he owes to you and to himself. But it is still more unworthy of you to acknowledge those suspicions in the hearing of a woman whom your own choice has doubly bound you to respect. He stopped. The two eyed each other for a moment in silence. It was impossible for Mercy to look at them, as she was looking now, without drawing the inevitable comparison between the manly force and dignity of Julian and the womanish malice and irritability of Horace. A last faithful impulse of loyalty toward the man to whom she had been betrothed impelled her to part them, before Horace had hopelessly degraded himself in her estimation by contrast with Julian. "'You had better wait to speak to me,' she said to him, "'until we are alone.' "'Certainly,' Horace answered with a sneer, "'if Mr. Julian Gray will permit it.' Mercy turned to Julian, with a look which said plainly, Pity us both and leave us. Do you wish me to go? he asked. Add to all your other kindnesses to me, she answered. Wait for me in that room. She pointed to the door that led into the dining room. Julian hesitated. You promise to let me know it if I can be of the smallest service to you, he said. Yes, yes. She followed him as he withdrew, and added rapidly in a whisper, "'Leave the door ajar.' He made no answer. As she returned to Horace, he entered the dining-room. The one concession he could make to her, he did make. He closed the door so noiselessly that not even her quick hearing could detect that he had shut it. Mercy spoke to Horace without waiting to let him speak first. I have promised you an explanation of my conduct, she said, in accents that trembled a little in spite of herself. I am ready to perform my promise. I have a question to ask you before you do that, he rejoined. Can you speak the truth? I am waiting to speak the truth. I will give you an opportunity. Are you, or are you not, in love with Julian Gray? You ought to be ashamed to ask the question. Is that your only answer? I have never been unfaithful to you, Horace, even in thought. If I had not been true to you, should I feel my position as you see I feel it now? He smiled bitterly. I have my own opinion, of your fidelity and of his honour, he said. You couldn't even send him into the next room without whispering to him first. Never mind that now. At least you know that Julian Gray is in love with you. Mr. Julian Gray has never breathed a word of it to me. 
A man can show a woman that he loves her without saying it in words. Mercy's power of endurance began to fail her. Not even Grace Roseberry had spoken more insultingly to her of Julian than Horace was speaking now. "'Whoever says that of Mr. Julian Gray lies,' she answered warmly. "'Then Lady Janet lies,' Horace retorted. "'Lady Janet never said it. Lady Janet is incapable of saying it.' "'She may not have said it in so many words, but she never denied it when I said it. I reminded her of the time when Julian Gray first heard from me that I was going to marry you. He was so overwhelmed that he was barely capable of being civil to me. Lady Janet was present and could not deny it. I asked her if she had observed since then signs of a confidential understanding between you two. She could not deny the signs. I asked if she had ever found you two together. She could not deny that she had found you two together this very day, under circumstances which justified suspicion. Yes, yes, look as angry as you like. You don't know what has been going on upstairs. Lady Janet is bent on breaking off our engagement, and Julian Gray is at the bottom of it. As to Julian, Horace was utterly wrong. But as to Lady Janet, he echoed the warning words which Julian himself had spoken to Mercy. She was staggered, but she still held to her own opinion. "'I don't believe it,' she said firmly. He advanced a step, and fixed his angry eyes on her searchingly. "'Do you know why Lady Janet sent for me?' he asked. "'No.' "'Then I will tell you. Lady Janet is a staunch friend of yours. There is no denying that. She wished to inform me that she had altered her mind about your promised explanation of your conduct. She said— Reflection has convinced me that no explanation is required. I have laid my positive commands on my adopted daughter that no explanation shall take place. Has she done that? Yes. Now observe. I waited till she had finished, and then I said, What have I to do with this? Lady Janet has one merit. She speaks out. You are to do as I do, she answered. You are to consider that no explanation is required, and you are to consign the whole matter to oblivion from this time forth. Are you serious? I asked. Quite serious. In that case, I have to inform your ladyship that you insist on more than you may suppose. You insist on my breaking my engagement to Miss Rosebery. Either I am to have the explanation that she has promised me, or I refuse to marry her. How do you think Lady Janet took that? She shut up her lips, and she spread out her hands, and she looked at me as much as to say, Just as you please. Refuse if you like. It's nothing to me. He paused for a moment. Mercy remained silent on her side. She foresaw what was coming. Mistaken in supposing that Horace had left the house, Julian had, beyond all doubt, been equally in error, in concluding that he had been entrapped into breaking off the engagement upstairs. "'Do you understand me so far?' Horace asked. "'I understand you perfectly. "'I will not trouble you much longer,' he resumed. "'I said to Lady Janet, "'Be so good as to answer me in plain words. "'Do you still insist on closing Miss Rosebery's lips?' "'I still insist,' she answered. "'No explanation is required.' 
if you are base enough to suspect your betrothed wife, I am just enough to believe in my adopted daughter. I replied, and I beg you will give your best attention to what I am now going to say. I replied to that, it is not fair to charge me with suspecting her. I don't understand her confidential relations with Julian Gray, and I don't understand her language and conduct in the presence of the police officer. I claim it as my right to be satisfied on both those points, in the character of the man who is to marry her. There was my answer. I spare you all that followed. I only repeat what I said to Lady Janet. She has commanded you to be silent. If you obey her commands, I owe it to myself, and I owe it to my family, to release you from your engagement. Choose between your duty to Lady Janet and your duty to me. He had mastered his temper at last. He spoke with dignity, and he spoke to the point. His position was unassailable. He claimed nothing but his right. "'My choice was made,' Mercy answered, "'when I gave you my promise upstairs.' She waited a little, struggling to control herself on the brink of the terrible revelation that was coming. Her eyes dropped before his. Her heart beat faster and faster. But she struggled bravely. With a desperate courage she faced the position. If you are ready to listen, she went on, I am ready to tell you why I insisted on having the police officer sent out of the house. Horace held up his hand warningly. Stop, he said. That is not all. His infatuated jealousy of Julian fatally misinterpreting her agitation, distrusted her at the very outset. She had limited herself to clearing up the one question of her interference with the officer of justice. The other question, of her relations with Julian, she had deliberately passed over. Horace instantly drew his own ungenerous conclusion. "'Let us not misunderstand one another.' he said. The explanation of your conduct in the other room is only one of the explanations which you owe me. You have something else to account for. Let us begin with that, if you please." She looked at him in unaffected surprise. "'What else have I to account for?' she asked. He again repeated his reply to Lady Janet. "'I have told you already he said. I don't understand your confidential relations with Julian Gray. Mercy's colour rose. Mercy's eyes began to brighten. Don't return to that, she cried, with an irrepressible outbreak of disgust. Don't, for God's sake, make me despise you at such a moment as this. His obstinacy only gathered fresh encouragement from that appeal to his better sense. I insist on returning to it. She had resolved to bear anything from him, as her fit punishment for the deception of which she had been guilty. But it was not in womanhood, at the moment when the first words of her confession were trembling on her lips, to endure Horace's unworthy suspicion of her. She rose from her seat and met his eyes firmly. "'I refuse to degrade myself, and to degrade Mr. Julian Gray, by answering you,' she said. "'Consider what you are doing,' he rejoined. "'Change your mind before it is too late.' "'You have had my reply.' Those resolute words that steady resistance seemed to infuriate him. He caught her roughly by the arm. "'You are as false as hell!' he cried. "'It's all over between you and me.' 
The loud, threatening tone in which he had spoken penetrated through the closed door of the dining-room. The door instantly opened. Julian returned to the library. He had just set foot in the room when there was a knock at the other door, the door that opened on the hall. One of the men-servants appeared with a telegraphic message in his hand. Mercy was the first to see it. It was the matron's answer to the letter which she had sent to the refuge. "'For Mr. Julian Gray?' she asked. "'Yes, miss. Give it to me.' She signed to the man to withdraw, and herself gave the telegram to Julian. "'It is addressed to you at my request,' she said. "'You will recognise the name of the person who sends it, "'and you will find a message in it for me.' Horace interfered before Julian could open the telegram. "'Another private understanding between you,' he said. "'Give me that telegram.' Julian looked at him with quiet contempt. "'It is directed to me.' he answered, and opened the envelope. The message inside was expressed in these terms. I am as deeply interested in her as you are. Say that I have received her letter, and that I welcome her back to the refuge with all my heart. I have business this evening in the neighbourhood. I will call for her myself at Mablethorpe House. The message explained itself. Of her own free will, she had made the expiation complete. Of her own free will, she was going back to the martyrdom of her old life. Bound as he knew himself to be, to let no compromising word or action escape him in the presence of Horace, the irrepressible expression of Julian's admiration glowed in his eyes as they rested on mercy. Horace detected the look. He sprang forward and tried to snatch the telegram out of Julian's hand. "'Give it to me,' he said. "'I will have it.' Julian silently put him back at arm's length. Maddened with rage, he lifted his hand threateningly. "'Give it to me,' he repeated between his set teeth, "'or it'll be the worse for you.' "'Give it to me,' said Mercy, suddenly placing herself between them. Julian gave it. She turned and offered it to Horace, looking at him with a steady eye, holding it out to him with a steady hand. "'Read it,' she said. Julian's generous nature pitied the man who had insulted him. Julian's great heart only remembered the friend of former times. "'Spare him,' he said to Mercy. "'Remember, he is unprepared.' She neither answered nor moved. Nothing stirred the horrible torpor of her resignation to her fate. She knew that the time had come. Julian appealed to Horace. "'Don't read it,' he cried. Hear what she has to say to you first. Horace's hand answered him with a contemptuous gesture. Horace's eyes devoured word by word the matron's message. He looked up when he had read it through. There was a ghastly change in his face as he turned it on Mercy. She stood between the two men like a statue. The life in her seemed to have died out, except in her eyes. Her eyes rested on Horace with a steady, glittering calmness. The silence was only broken by the low murmuring of Julian's voice. His face was hidden in his hands. He was praying for them. Horace spoke, laying his finger on the telegram. His voice had changed with the change in his face. The tone was low and trembling. No one would have recognised it as the tone of Horace's voice. "'What does this mean?' he said to Mercy. "'It can't be for you.' 
it is for me. What have you to do with a refuge? Without a change in her face, without a movement in her limbs, she spoke the fatal words. I have come from a refuge, and I am going back to a refuge. Mr. Horace Holmcroft, I am Mercy Merrick. End of chapter 25Chapter 26 of The New Magdalen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The New Magdalen by Wilkie Collins. Chapter 26 Great Heart and Little Heart. There was a pause. The moments passed, and not one of the three moved. The moments passed, and not one of the three spoke. Insensibly, the words of supplication died away on Julian's lips. Even his energy failed to sustain him, tried as it was now by the crushing oppression of suspense. The first trifling movement which suggested the idea of change and which so brought with it the first vague sense of relief, came from mercy. Incapable of sustaining the prolonged effort of standing, she drew back a little and took a chair. No outward manifestation of emotion escaped her. There she sat, with the death-like torpor of resignation in her face, waiting her sentence in silence from the man at whom she had hurled the whole terrible confession of the truth in one sentence. Julian lifted his head as she moved. He looked at Horace, and advancing a few steps, looked again. There was fear in his face as he suddenly turned it toward Mercy. "'Speak to him,' he said in a whisper. "'Rouse him before it's too late.' She moved mechanically in her chair. She looked mechanically at Julian. "'What more have I to say to him?' she asked in faint, weary tones. "'Did I not tell him everything when I told him my name?' The natural sound of her voice might have failed to affect Horace. The altered sound of it roused him. He approached Mercy's chair with a dull surprise in his face, and put his hand in a weak, wavering way on her shoulder. In that position he stood for a while, looking down at her in silence. The one idea in him that found its way outward to expression was the idea of Julian. Without moving his hand, without looking up from Mercy, he spoke for the first time since the shock had fallen on him. "'Where is Julian?' he asked very quietly. "'I am here, Horace, close by you. "'Will you do me a service?' "'Certainly. How can I help you?' He considered a little before he replied. His hand left Mercy's shoulder and went up to his head, then dropped at his side. His next words were spoken in a sadly helpless, bewildered way. "'I have an idea, Julian, that I have been somehow to blame. I said some hard words to you. It was a little while since. I don't clearly remember what it was all about. My temper has been a good deal tried in this house.' I have never been used to the sort of thing that goes on here. Secrets and mysteries, and hateful low-lived quarrels. We have no secrets and mysteries at home, and as for quarrels, ridiculous. My mother and my sisters are highly bred women. You know them. Gentlewomen, in the best sense of the word. When I'm with them, I have no anxieties. 
I am not harassed at home by doubts of who people are and confusion about names and so on. I suspect the contrast weighs a little on my mind and upsets it. They make me over-suspicious among them here, and it ends in my feeling doubts and fears that I can't get over. Doubts about you and fears about myself. I have got a fear about myself now. I want you to help me. Shall I make an apology first? Don't say a word. Tell me what I can do. He turned his face toward Julian for the first time. Just look at me, he said. Does it strike you that I am at all wrong in my mind? Tell me the truth, old fellow. Your nerves are a little shaken, Horace, nothing more. He considered again after that reply, his eyes remaining anxiously fixed on Julian's face. My nerves are a little shaken, he repeated. That is true. I feel they are shaken. I should like, if you don't mind, to make sure that it's no worse. Will you help me to try if my memory is all right? I will do anything you like. Ah, oh, you are a good fellow, Julian, and a clear-headed fellow, too, which is very important just now. Look here. I say it's about a week since the troubles began in this house. Do you say so, too? Yes. The troubles came in with the coming of a woman from Germany, a stranger to us, who behaved very violently in the dining-room there. Am I right so far? Quite right. The woman carried matters with a high hand. She claimed Colonel Rosebery. I wish to be strictly accurate. She claimed the late Colonel Rosebery as her father. She told a tiresome story about her having been robbed of her papers and her name by an impostor who had personated her. She said the name of the impostor was Mercy Merrick, and she afterward put the climax to it all. She pointed to the lady who is engaged to be my wife, and declared that she was Mercy Merrick. Tell me again, is that right or wrong? Julian answered him as before. He went on, speaking more confidently and more excitedly than he had spoken yet. Now attend to this, Julian. I'm going to pass from my memory of what happened a week ago to my memory of what happened five minutes since. You were present. I want to know if you heard it too. He paused, and without taking his eyes off Julian, pointed backward to Mercy. "'There is the lady who is engaged to marry me,' he resumed. "'Did I, or did I not hear her say, that she had come out of a refuge, and that she was going back to a refuge? Did I, or did I not, hear her own to my face, that her name was Mercy Merrick? Answer me, Julian. My good friend, answer me for the sake of old times. His voice faltered as he spoke those imploring words. Under the dull blank of his face there appeared the first signs of emotion, slowly forcing its way outward. The stunned mind was reviving faintly. Julian saw his opportunity of aiding the recovery, and seized it. He took Horace gently by the arm, and pointed to Mercy. "'There is your answer,' he said. "'Look and pity her.' She had not once interrupted them while they had been speaking. She had changed her position again, and that was all. There was a writing-table at the side of her chair. Her outstretched arms rested on it. Her head had dropped on her arms, and her face was hidden. 
Julian's judgment had not misled him. The utter self-abandonment of her attitude answered Horace as no human language could have answered him. He looked at her. A quick spasm of pain passed across his face. He turned once more to the faithful friend who had forgiven him. His head fell on Julian's shoulder, and he burst into tears. Mercy started wildly to her feet and looked at the two men. "'Oh, God!' she cried. "'What have I done?' Julian quieted her by a motion of his hand. "'You have helped me to save him,' he said. "'Let his tears have their way. Wait.' He put one arm round Horace to support him. The manly tenderness of the action, the complete and noble pardon of past injuries which it implied, touched Mercy to the heart. She went back to her chair. Again shame and sorrow overpowered her, and again she hid her face from view. Julian led Horace to a seat, and silently waited by him until he had recovered his self-control. He gratefully took the kind hand that had sustained him. He said simply, almost boyishly, "'Thank you, Julian. I am better now.' "'Are you composed enough to listen to what is said to you?' Julian asked. "'Yes. Do you wish to speak to me?' Julian left him without immediately replying, and returned to Mercy. "'The time has come.' he said. Tell him all, truly, unreservedly, as you would tell it to me. She shuddered as he spoke. Have I not told him enough? she asked. Do you want me to break his heart? Look at him. Look what I have done already. Horace shrank from the ordeal as Mercy shrank from it. "'No, no, I can't listen to it, I daren't listen to it,' he cried, and rose to leave the room. Julian had taken the good work in hand. He never faltered over it for an instant. Horace had loved her. How dearly Julian now knew for the first time. The bare possibility that she might earn her pardon if she was allowed to plead her own cause— was a possibility still left. To let her win on Horace to forgive her was death to the love that still filled his heart in secret. But he never hesitated. With a resolution which the weaker man was powerless to resist, he took him by the arm and led him back to his place. For her sake, and for your sake, you shall not condemn her unheard he said to Horace firmly. One temptation to deceive you after another has tried her, and she has resisted them all. With no discovery to fear, with a letter from the benefactress who loves her, commanding her to be silent, with everything that a woman values in this world to lose if she owns what she has done, this woman, for the truth's sake, has spoken the truth. Does she deserve nothing at your hands in return for that? Respect her, Horace, and hear her. Horace yielded. Julian turned to Mercy. You have allowed me to guide you so far, he said. Will you allow me to guide you still? Her eyes sank before his. Her bosom rose and fell. His influence over her maintained its sway. She bowed her head in speechless submission. "'Tell him,' Julian proceeded, in accents of entreaty, not of command, "'tell him what your life has been. Tell him how you were tried and tempted, with no friend near, to speak the words which might have saved you. And then—' he added, raising her from the chair. Let him judge you, if he can. 
he attempted to lead her across the room to the place which Horace occupied. But her submission had its limits. Halfway to the place she stopped, and refused to go further. Julian offered her a chair. She declined to take it. Standing with one hand on the back of the chair, she waited for the word from Horace which would permit her to speak. She was resigned to the ordeal. Her face was calm, her mind was clear. The hardest of all humiliations to endure, the humiliation of acknowledging her name, she had passed through. Nothing remained but to show her gratitude to Julian by acceding to his wishes, and to ask pardon of Horace before they parted for ever. In a little while the matron would arrive at the house, and then it would be over. Unwillingly Horace looked at her. Their eyes met. He broke out suddenly with something of his former violence. "'I can't realise it even now,' he cried. "'Is it true that you are not Grace Rosebury? "'Don't look at me. "'Say in one word, yes or no.' "'She answered him humbly and sadly, "'Yes. "'You have done what that woman accused you of doing? "'Am I to believe that?' "'You are to believe it, sir.' All the weakness of Horace's character disclosed itself when she made that reply. "'Infamous!' he exclaimed. "'What excuse can you make for the cruel deception you have practised on me? "'Too bad! Too bad! There can be no excuse for you!' She accepted his reproaches with unshaken resignation. "'I have deserved it was all she said to herself. I have deserved it. Julian interposed once more in Mercy's defence. "'Wait till you are sure there is no excuse for her, Horace,' he said quietly. "'Grant her justice, if you can grant no more. I leave you together.' He advanced toward the door of the dining-room. Horace's weakness disclosed itself once more. "'Don't leave me alone with her!' he burst out. "'The misery of it is more than I can bear!' Julian looked at Mercy. Her face brightened faintly. The momentary expression of relief told him how truly he would be befriending her if he consented to remain in the room. A position of retirement was offered to him by a recess formed by the central bay window of the library. If he occupied this place, they could see or not see that he was present, as their own inclinations might decide them. "'I will stay with you, Horace, as long as you wish me to be here.' Having answered in those terms, he stopped as he passed Mercy on his way to the window. His quick and kindly insight told him that he might still be of some service to her. A hint from him might show her the shortest and the easiest way of making her confession. Delicately and briefly he gave her the hint. The first time I met you, I saw that your life had had its troubles. Let us hear how those troubles began. He withdrew to his place in the recess. For the first time since the fatal evening when she and Grace Rosebury had met in the French cottage, Mercy Merrick looked back into the purgatory on earth of her past life, and told her sad story, simply and truly, in these words. End of chapter 26